The adjustable wrench, or crescent wrench, as it's commonly called in the United States, was invented in the mid-1800s, and we've been tearing off our knuckles with them ever since. You might not give much thought to adjustable wrenches, but if you own a toolbox, most likely you're going to have an adjustable wrench in it. Even though many different types of adjustable wrenches were invented during the Industrial Revolution, the design that we're most familiar with wasn't invented until 1842. Adjustable wrenches were a very important tool developed during the Industrial Revolution when the use of metal fasteners came into widespread use on machinery, railroads, factories, and building construction. Even today, with all the sockets and wrench variations available to us, we still depend on the crescent wrench when those other wrenches aren't available. The invention of the first adjustable wrench, also known as the adjustable spanner or English key in many parts of the world, was commonly credited to an English engineer named Richard Clyburn in 1842. Another English engineer, Edward Budding, who is best known for his invention of the first lawnmower in 1830, is also credited with the invention of the adjustable spanner in 1842 as well. Though these two inventors were credited, if you look at the 1857 patent by Edward J. Worcester, you see a strong resemblance to today's adjustable wrenches, and it probably had a lot of influence on the design, and it deserves mention. The crescent wrench's exact origins are actually still somewhat obscure and were more likely the result of an amalgamation of designs over the years. In 1891, the Clyburn adjustable wrench was further improved by the Swedish inventor J.P. Johansson into a form that closely resembles its modern form, though the mechanism appears to have been strongly influenced by earlier designs. Johansson was a holder of at least 100 patents and the founder of the company that would later become known as Baco. Around the same time as adjustable wrench patent was granted, Johansson sold his marketing rights to B.A. Hajorth and Company to produce his wrenches and sell them under the Baco trademark, which is an acronym of the B.A. Hajorth and Company name. Under Johansson's supervision, Baco made further improvements to the wrench, which included reducing the 45 degree handle to jaw angle to 15 degrees, which was more user friendly. They also introduced the I beam handle, which allowed the wrench to be much lighter and more easily gripped, and likely also reduced the amount of steel needed during manufacturing. By 1964, Baco had manufactured over 35 million wrenches and is widely accepted as the first manufacturer of the adjustable wrench, or crescent wrench that we're familiar with, and it remains the largest producer of the adjustable wrench outside the United States. The Crescent Tool Company of Jamestown, New York was founded in 1907 by Carl Peterson. In 1910, it began marketing an adjustable wrench with features much like those made by Baco. Even though there were many competing adjustable wrench manufacturers in the early 20th century, Crescent maintained a strong position in the market for many decades due to their high quality. The Crescent name then became synonymous with the adjustable wrench in the United States. One of those competitors was the J.H. Williams Company, who began offering an adjustable wrench in 1930. Although it resembled the Baco and Crescent wrenches, one unique design improvement set it apart from its predecessors. That is, the keyway for the adjustable jaw on the J.H. Williams wrench had a D-shaped profiled keyway, whereas the other brands featured a round profile. This is important because the D-shaped keyway gave the movable jaw flat contact surfaces to transfer pressure. This reduced lateral keyway deflection and therefore reduced jaw deflection. The wrench I'm restoring in this video is the model AP12 Super Adjustable, manufactured by the J.H. Williams Company. I consider it a lucky find because it's known as a high quality wrench. The AP12 started production in 1968, though I don't know the specific year this particular wrench was made. Although these wrenches were typically chrome plated at the factory, I don't have the capability to do that in my own shop, at least not yet. Still, I wanted to restore this tool and make it look as nice as I possibly could, meanwhile protecting the finish from further corrosion. Zinc plating works really well for that, so that's what I'm going to use. The first thing I needed to do was rinse off the excess dirt and see the extent of the rust. I quickly found that the threaded pin holding the scroll wheel in place was stripped. That was a little difficult to remove, but nothing that pounding it against the workbench wouldn't solve.
I used coarse crushed glass blasting media to remove some of the heavier scale. I only added a few pounds of it to my blasting cabinet so that it would break down quickly. As it broke down, the finer media was able to clean out any small pits in the wrench. I knew that I wouldn't be able to get rid of all the pits without removing a lot of material, so I only concentrated on leveling the surface and removing some of the smaller voids. Using an old tap, I cleaned out any remaining debris from the threads and confirmed the thread size. I checked the original threaded pin for size and wear and then settled on a size for the new pin. Instead of starting with a piece of tool steel and cutting the threads, I took the lazy way out and used a hardened bolt that was already threaded. This would save me some time. I've always found it tricky trying to cut screwdriver slots by hand. I always seem to get them off center, but this one turned out pretty good.
Since I planned on zinc plating the ranch, it was very important to have the surface completely free of grease and oil. I used a bath of alkaline hot tanking solution and soaked the parts for about 10 minutes. I dipped the wrench in a pickling bath made up of dilute hydrochloric acid. This lightly etches the surface so the zinc plating can adhere to it well. After about 30 seconds we're good to go. After the wrench is neutralized and rinsed off, I start the zinc plating. I lightly vapor blast the wrench between layers of plating. The zinc plating solution itself is a homebrew mix consisting of 1 liter of 5% white vinegar to 100 grams of Epsom salts. It also calls for 120 grams of sugar to brighten the finish, but I've never found that that does anything except make everything sticky. I use pure zinc for the anodes and run the current around 65 milliamps per square inch of part surface at 1.5 to 4 volts, but I don't get too concerned over the volts. It's important to move the wrench into several different positions to get every surface plated equally. Zinc ions move in a straight line through the solution so shadowing can occur. After the final layer of zinc plating, I vapor blast the wrench one last time and dry it off. It won't have the same reflective finish like a chrome wrench has, but will instead have a satin silver look. A reflective finish would have made the pit stand out even more, so the satin finish helps to tone it down a little, though not as much as I would have liked. I then plate and vapor blast the other parts the same way. Now that all the parts are plated, I dip them in a clear blue conversion solution. This converts the zinc surface into a hard coat that will withstand corrosion. If you don't do a conversion, the zinc will quickly turn chalky and tacky after exposure to humidity for a few days. After rinsing and drying, I heated the parts to 150 degrees for about a half an hour to harden the conversion layer. You can also let them cure at room temperature for 24 hours if you want to. The last thing I do before assembly is to wipe everything down with a lanolin based oil for further corrosion protection. After it's reassembled, the wrench is ready to go back into service.